It's time to take your seat in the front row with Mike Vaccaro. Here's your host, Mike Vaccaro. Hey, thank you, Chuck, and welcome, everybody. Mike Vaccaro here in the front row once again. As always, it's J.R. Quitman, our creator, producer, and director behind the scenes. Up to episode number 32, a special treat. It's Mike Golick Sr. joining us here today. He talks to us about his athletic career playing football and wrestling in high school at Notre Dame and a great outstanding nine-year career in the NFL as well, most notably with the Philadelphia Eagles. Then obviously most of you know him as a broadcaster with ESPN and now podcasting. Talks about his time with Mike and Mike, how that show ended, how Golick and Wingo ended as well. All that, plus we talk about Hank. His pug. That's all straight ahead. Episode number 32 of In the Front Row. It's Mike Golick Sr. Mike, first of all, thanks so much for joining us here this morning. I know you're on a high right now with your Notre Dame Fighting Irish making it to the College World Series. So uh, come down for a little bit and, uh, and speak to us here today. But uh, we appreciate your time today for sure. Oh, my pleasure. Let me tell you, that was a, that was a lot of fun watching. You know, it's, it's one thing to get there. It's good enough to get there, obviously. But when you do it knocking off, the number one seed in their home. It's uh, it's pretty cool and uh, didn't look good for a while there after game two and then uh, not having the lead in game three, but they came through first time in 20 years. So uh, pretty impressive. Background here in the, in start, first of all, you, you were born just outside of uh, Cleveland in, uh, in uh, Willowick, Ohio, uh, born there and grew up with your, your brothers as well. What was life like early on for you and, and, and sports, I would assume, with three brothers in the house was was pretty big at the time. Yeah, it was. You know, my dad played um, um, in the Marine Corps. He played football at Indiana for a little bit and then the Marine Corps. And then he played in the CFL for a number of years. So uh, he was a football player. And when um, he was asked to or offered to go play in the NFL, but Bob and Greg were born and I was on the way. So he decided to kind of settle down. So, yeah, sports has always been a big part. In fact, the first thing that we all did competitively was swimming. Um, we all started when we were like six, seven years old, love swimming, absolutely love swimming. And, um, so we did that first and then we did what I, I wish kids would do today. And I know it's a lot harder is, uh, is play all different sports. I mean, um, to really be versatile there. I know it's a little more difficult today, but we played everything until we kind of grew big and honed in on football. Um, but uh, I'll never forget my brother, Bob, who's six years older than me went to my dad and said, uh, you know, I want to play football. And my dad, who had played, basically told him, you're going to get punched, kicked. You're going to tear stuff, break bones. You know, he told all the bad things that could happen to you. And Bob was like, yeah, you know, I still want to do it. And, you know, that kind of started uh, the Golic boys, you know, on, on our way into the, uh, to the football world. But, yeah, we did everything, baseball, football, basketball, wrestling, you know, we did it all, all growing up. And, uh, and I, I tried to have my kids do the same thing, be very, very versatile. Did you find that one sport helped the other, you know, again, oh. because you're seeing more specializing in sports for, for youth these days. Without question, wrestling helped football so much. I don't think the other way around, I don't, I don't know if football helped wrestling, but wrestling certainly helped football. And then the sport wasn't really around when I was growing up, but when we moved to Connecticut, <clears throat> when I started with ESPN, the boys uh, played baseball. Like I said, they played everything, but they picked up lacrosse. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they found out, my boys were bigger than everybody. And then Jake was also faster than everybody, as well as being bigger than everybody. So he was that midi. Mike was a defenseman. When they realized they could hit people with a stick and hit people, <laughs> they never picked up a baseball bat again. And that sport, I think, really, really helps develop um, all around it's hand-eye coordination, it's foot quickness. It's, uh, obviously, uh, technique and leverage for hitting as well. I think that sport does a great job in kind of cross promoting sports. You stick to one sport using the same muscles over and over again, when you're growing up and think you need to develop all the different muscles. So that's why I was a big proponent of that. My daughter, Sydney, who is the youngest. So she grew up with two older, tough brothers she saw them playing lacrosse and she wanted to play lacrosse at a young age. So she went to play lacrosse and she played it for one day when she realized in women's lacrosse, you weren't allowed to hit anybody. She went out on the practice field and just kept knocking girls down. They kept saying, you can't do that. She came home. She said, I don't, I don't want to play if I can't play like, 
Mike and Jake play. So <laughs> that was the end of her short-lived lacrosse career. <laughs> and the beginning of her swimming career, right? She was an outstanding swimmer. Yeah, she was. She also soccer as well. They were like the youth state champs. Whatever. You know, soccer is, she was huge in Connecticut. So she was a goalie. So she did that for a number of years. But she she got really good at swimming at an early age, you know, eight, nine, ten area to where we started traveling around a bit around the country. So that that while she was playing soccer and and other sports as well, that that one kind of because it was a year round sport really demanded that attention for swimming. There was there's no off season in swimming. You go from yards to meters, short course to long course. So it's constant. So that's a tough sport. You know, that's where you know, kids have to start young, somewhat like gymnastics, where that's that's what you do. So where I talk about I want to I love when young kids are versatile. There definitely are some sports that go year round and you have to, you know, jump into those. So when she was probably 12, she jumped into that one full time and probably 12 to 16. She really hit the national scene pretty well. Uh, and like I said, we traveled around a bit before she went and started swimming at Notre Dame. Yeah, it seems like today, youth sports, you've got to play year round because everybody is doing it and, and you've got to yeah. keep up. And, you know, for you, again, as you said, you played several different sports, but you eventually honed in on football and wrestling when you went to the high school in, in Cleveland. Uh, you know, what was it about those sports? As you said, they, they kind of helped out one another. But why did it come down to those two as really the ones that maybe set you apart? Probably because I was better at those than the other ones. <laughs> I had trouble hitting the curve in baseball. Uh, I was not a very good basketball player. I could give you six great fouls, <clears throat> which I enjoyed doing. Um, track and field, I actually ran and uh, shot put and high jumped. I did that for a while as well. I enjoyed that. But uh, there was no doubt from a sports stand, uh, standpoint, I, I excelled a little more in football and wrestling. So I kind of kind of geared things that way. And I love foot, uh, wrestling just as much as football, yeah. without question, I, you know, Bob wrestled at Notre Dame. I wrestled at Notre Dame as well. Unfortunately, they dropped the program a couple of years after I left. Uh, but but I, I loved it. I love wrestling is about that pure, you know, somewhat like boxing, MMA, uh, not where you're getting punched or anything, more along the lines of that one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, it's just you and another guy. It's you and another person. So that's it. There's no excuses. You actually, you were, you were better than that person or they were better than you. You know, while I love team sports and love football, you have teammates that you can rely on. And in wrestling, you don't. It is you out there doing your thing. And, man, I I just absolutely loved it. So, And like I said, it really coincided well with, with football. And as you said, you did it in high school. You did it at Notre Dame. You're in the National Wrestling Hall of Fame as well because you're, you're such a, a big proponent of the sport as well. What kind of honor was that for you to to be named and in, into that Hall of Fame? <laughs> Well, it was a great honor. Now, I, I'm not going to lie. I'd much rather have gone into the Wrestling Hall of Fame as a wrestler. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, 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 I, I was very, very happy. Yes, I, I love being, you know, a backer of wrestling and talking. I talked a lot about it for a couple of decades on my show. Um, so that was a wonderful honor. But no doubt walking through that Hall of Fame and seeing the wrestlers there, you know, I, I, I wish it, I wrestled saw I didn't wrestle freshman year because I needed to gain some weight for football. I wrestled sophomore year, junior year. Then I didn't wrestle senior year because I hurt my shoulder playing football and I had to get ready for the draft. So um, it was uh, enjoyable and the honor was incredible just being around all the great wrestlers, you know, that, that I watched uh, and or grew up watching. It was, it was interesting. The first time I went to ESPN when I was done in the NFL, I got sent out on, on stories. And one of the stories was Dan Gable and what he was doing coaching Iowa. That well, what a thrill. I got to be in the wrestling room. They let me in the wrestling room and, and all through practice and interviewing, you know, the wrestlers as they were, you know, throwing up in between drills in a big bucket. Uh, and Dan was still out there, you know, knocking people around. I mean, that was that was an incredible experience for me because I have such respect for what wrestlers do. I was always a heavyweight, so I never had to lose weight. You know, watch these guys have to cut weight and then go wrestle it was absolutely incredible. I always cleaned up, though. In wrestling after weigh-ins, there'd be hours before the match. They would bring a lot of food to eat to try and, and – and their eyes would always be bigger than their stomach because they were cutting weight. They could never finish their food, and I would just clean up on all the food that they brought. <laughs> 
Yeah, you mentioned Dan Gable, one of the huge names in, in college wrestling with his uh, career at Iowa there. Um, so again, a Notre Dame there from 81 to 85. And, and take us through the, the recruitment process. Jerry Faust was the coach at the time. W were you recruited as a dual sport athlete? Well, I, I had told everybody um, who had recruited me that I was going to wanted to wrestle as well. And, and I there was no <clears throat> there, there was no, you know, wall I hit or anything. I mean, that would be during like the uh, winter workouts when you'd go in and lift and run drills and I was wrestling. It's not like I wasn't working out. I would tell any football player, come in and wrestle, you know, yeah. and see, see how you feel doing that. Certainly different things you're working, but the, the recruiting process, listen, Bob had gone there. Um, my brother, Bob had gone there. He was in the NFL at this point. My brother, Greg was a freshman at Notre Dame. It's certainly where I wanted to go, but you know, I, I had a lot of other schools talking to, and I actually had trips set up to, I think, Tennessee, UCLA, Miami, Texas, somewhere else. You know, I had some trips set up, but Jerry Faust called me. Now, this is back in the day when you actually committed your senior year. Now kids are committing in the ninth grade. Uh, it was actually, you actually took your five trips after your senior year. So we would finish playing in November, and then the signing date was in February. You would take your trips then you know, way different than it is now. So I had trips set up and my season ended in about the second week of November. Uh, but Jerry Faust called me actually on Thanksgiving morning and he offered me a scholarship. And I actually said to him, I said, coach, listen, it's, it's the only place I want to go. I said, but I got these trips set up, man. I just kind of want to go have some fun. You <laughs> mind if I, you know, don't say anything, you know, and let me go take these other trips. And, and didn't quite work out that way. It kind of went out on the wire that I, committed to Notre Dame and all the other schools, unfortunately called and had to cancel, <laughs> cancel the trips, but it was where I wanted to go. Uh, so that, that, that call came on Thanksgiving in my senior year. And I, I didn't even hesitate. Again, this is 1981 pre-social media and the word yeah. still got out there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It still, it still got, well, it got out to the colleges, you know, so yeah. it was, you know, that day you had to wait for the paper to come out or, or it was on the news and then colleges obviously find out. So yeah, definitely a little different then, but yeah, it got out. And uh, I was looking forward to, to taking some trips and uh, one by one, those schools called and said, we heard you committed. And what was I going to say? No. I said, yeah, yeah I did. You know, sorry. <laughs> what's, what's your biggest takeaway from your, your time at Notre Dame? They're from 81, graduated in 85. Yeah. You went to a couple of bowl games. You were a captain your, your senior year. What's, what's your takeaway of your time there on the, the football field? Well, I mean, on, on the positive side, it was Notre Dame. It's where I always yeah. wanted to go. I have a degree from Notre Dame. Um, we have such a family history there, not only with me and my brothers, but uh, my family as well. My wife being from St. Mary's, her sister, all my kids playing at Notre Dame, their sport. So the history there is probably, you know, to, to us, Notre Dame equates family. We have a house here, you know, half the year we spend at our house right, right, on, right by campus here. Um, so it is ingrained in our kind of being right now. We're going to start a Golic Family Foundation golf tournament right on the Notre Dame golf course this summer, the first of hopefully many to raise money for uh, area groups that need it around here. So we are really entrenched here. That's probably the biggest thing. Um, obviously, from a sports you know, standpoint, it all didn't go that great. I think our best record was seven and four. I think our biggest win was my sophomore year. We traveled to the pit. Dan Marino was a quarterback. Their whole offensive line, I would eventually play against them all in the NFL. They were unbelievable. I think they were 7-0 and and number one in the country. We went to Pitt and we beat them. And I remember coming back to campus and driving down Notre Dame Ave in the bus off the off our, our, our charter back and, and students just lining the street, you know, jumping in the bus and, and, and celebrating with us. And I thought, man, this, this, is, this is what I came to to Notre Dame for from the sports aspect. You know, my brother Bob, when he was here, he had won a national title in 77, and and I saw the euphoria there, and I was hoping to, to match that. But unfortunately, that was one of our bigger wins. And like I said, we went to the Liberty Bowl where we did beat Boston College, Doug Flutie's senior year, and then we went to the Aloha Bowl my senior year. We lost that game to SMU, uh, but it was a trip to Hawaii, so that, that was, it wasn't all that bad. So from, from the, the, the sports side, Unfortunately, it didn't pan out like, you know, we all would like to when we go to a school like Notre Dame. But certainly, you know, you, you, you don't trade all the other stuff that came along with it. Mitch and Dan Marino, Doug Flutie, you have a chance to, to sack those guys or at least knock them down a little bit in your career, either at Notre Dame or 
later on in the, the NFL? Well, I, I ended up being my last year in the NFL as a teammate of Dan Marino's in 93 mm -hmm. when I was with the Dolphins. Uh, we became very good friends, but he was always a tough one to sack because he had such a quick release. He was a great – people would forget what a great athlete he was moving. Then he had the knee issues before that really slowed him down, but he had such a quick release. Flutie, I probably never caught. I mean, in nine years in the NFL, I had 11 and a half sacks. So while I call that consistency at just over <laughs> one a year – Quite honestly, that's called some horrific pass rushing. I was more a a run stopper. So there are not a lot of, uh, as they say, quarterback pelts on my wall of guys that I've gotten to. Well, you cleared the way for some other guys. We'll get to that here in a moment. Yeah. But, uh, I want to talk about, you know, you said you're getting ready for the draft. So 1985, drafted by the, the Houston Oilers at the time. Um, what's going through your mind? How do you find out that you're drafted? So here's uh, the mistake I made was... And, and really, I it, I can't blame anybody for this. You know, we grew up in the mentality that my dad had when we were playing Little League football of basically, if you can walk, you can play. Mm -hmm. You know, you play through anything. And that, while it can show toughness, doesn't always show the, the, the smartest move in the world um, because you have to know the difference of injured and hurt. You play hurt. You saw, and most of the time we played injured when you shouldn't play injured. I got hurt my um, first game my senior year, actually injured it. I tore my shoulder some. And I should have had the surgery then and come back the next year. But I didn't. And I really had no one telling me to do that. I'm, and I'm not looking to blame anybody else. It's still my decision. You know, I'm just about a 21-year-old person. You know, I can I can make these decisions. So I never played more than a half in any in the rest of this season because the there was just too much damage done. And then because after my junior year, I think I was an honorable mention All American. They were talking about possibly second round. You know, you hear all that stuff. You still got to go out and play. Well, unfortunately, I didn't play a whole lot my senior year. Like I said, no more than a half each game. And then right after the season, I had the surgery. So when I went to the combine, which, by the way, was at Arizona State, everybody knows of it at Indianapolis now. Mm -hmm. It was at Arizona State outside on the grass. I couldn't do anything because I just had surgery. So I couldn't run any drills. I just got torn apart by the doctors there and uh, ended up going in the 10th round. So it wasn't the smartest decision in the world for me. Like I said, I, I should have redshirted or, or taken the, the medical year and, and, and got better and come back the next year. But I didn't, you know, and the path still was the path. Um, so getting the call on that day, you know, it, it's a three day draft now, back then it was a two day draft. I think I got the call the second day closer to midnight. You know, my brother, Bob came in with a couple of cases of beer and we were just kind of hanging around in the dorm room, me and my brother, Greg and Bob and some friends. Cause I had other guys on the team drafted that year as well. And yeah, 10th round is a long time, a uh, long time. So I, I had a few drinks, took a little nap, had a few more drinks, you know, and, and then that second day, I get a call from the GM of the uh, the Oilers saying they they drafted me. I said thank you very much, and uh, was there a couple of days later. So it was it was a great moment being drafted, no doubt about it. You know, even though it was number two fifty five overall in the tenth round, you know, I was still a number being drafted. You know, a lot of people say, you know, maybe it's better if you went a free agent, you pick your team, and that could be true. You know, that's a route my son Mike went and it's certainly when you get to the later rounds can be a thought process of you can kind of pick your spot a little better but I got drafted so you get drafted there's nothing you can do about it. it's not like you it's not like you say well no thanks you know <laughs> you say thank you very much I'll I'll, I'll see you very soon <laughs> so the injury was part of you know where you were picked and the round you were picked but did you did that kind of create a little chip on your shoulder as well going into your career uh not a chip so much as a more playing out of fear um, you know, I, I'll never forget. And it was interesting because, because that's kind of the way I looked at it. I said, okay, I'm a 10th rounder. I'm damaged goods. I got to bust my ass or, mm -hmm. you know, 10th rounders ain't going to make it. I'll never forget years later when I was doing the show, we had the great John Hanna on for those that yeah. don't know John Hanna. John Hanna was a hall of fame offensive guard for the New England Patriots. He was actually a teammate of my brother Bob's in the late seventies. This guy was an animal. This guy was about as vicious and as physical a lineman as ever has been in the league. And I remember we had him on the air and, and I asked him because he was an all pro all the time. He was the best, you know, for years. I said, so John, what motivated you? And he said, 
fear. I said, fear? I said, what the hell did you have to fear? He said, fear of letting down my teammates. Mm -hmm. So I never wanted to let them down. So that was always in the back of my mind. And that's certainly part of team sports. You don't want to let your teammate down. But for me, it was that initial fear of, I'm a 10th rounder. I'm not expected to make it. Um, I, I think I'm better than a 10th rounder, but I need to go out and prove it. So I would say of my nine years, probably five of them, maybe four to five, I was pretty secure as my career was going on that I knew I was going to be on the team, but you know, close to half of those times I wasn't, and I was, you know, fighting for a roster spot. Um, and the good thing back then is once you made a roster, you're usually on it. A lot of times today, the back end of that roster changes all the time. Um, but then if you made the team, you were pretty much on it. I was on injury reserve my first year. I broke my ankle. Um, and I started probably a little over half the games in my career. Uh, so I, I did enjoy that. But, yeah, it was it was a lot of, uh-oh, you know, I got a hell of a lot of work to do of where I was drafted. And it's amazing. Once a 10th rounder, always a 10th rounder. It's like you always have to keep proving yourself over and over again. Yeah. Football, broadcasting, life, everything uh, kind of goes along with that theme, I guess, for you. Yeah. Um, you know, 85 to 87, you're with the Oilers and 87 with, starts your run with the Eagles. Is that where you started to feel comfortable and, and felt like you belong there because you're playing for a head coach and Buddy Ryan, who's a defensive minded coach that had to play well into obviously you being a defensive tackle? Yeah, definitely. Because I was a linebacker my years, my last couple of years at Notre Dame. So I had uh, my first year, I was like a, a D tackle, but that didn't last long. I was a linebacker. So when I got to Houston, they played a three, four. So all of a sudden I was a nose tackle and I'm like, holy hell, a nose tackle. I will never forget my first time playing against Pittsburgh, Mike Webster and that offensive line, that incredible trapping scheme they had. And he was a hall of famer. I mean, they kicked the crap out of me, kicked it. And my brother Bob was a nose tackle at that point, but again, six years old. So he had been in the league a while. And I remember I always go to the person I play the most after the game, shake their hand, tell them good game. And I I was running toward Mike Webster after that game. He's like, good game, good game. I'm like, good game. I'm like, you kicked my ass all over the field. He said, it's a hard scheme. He goes, ask your brother the first time he played, you know, played our scheme as a nose tackle. It's tough. He said, you'll get it. He was such a nice guy. You know, after just destroying me him in his line, he was he was so nice. It was, it was, it was pretty cool. But so, you know, playing no tackle there, you know, you just play it. You know, I learned from my dad long ago, if they ask you, can you do something? You say, hell yes. And then you learn how to do it. So I'd never played nose, but I wasn't telling them that. I'm just going to get it nose tackle and I'm going to play. So I got released after the, the strike. I got, I was very pro union at that 87 strike. I got caught throwing rocks at the buses and blah, blah, blah. Dumb shit you do, you know, when, when you're growing up and, uh, Houston kept a lot of the replacement players, and I was actually starting before the strike. And after the strike, I was not even dressing for the games. And Jerry Glanville was the coach, and I get along very well with Jerry now. I said, listen, if this is the deal, I was starting, and now I'm not playing because you didn't like what I did, you know, uh, as far as the union, just cut me. And, you know, be careful what you wish for. They cut me. Um, and I had a couple of trips set up, and the first one was a Philly. And, I, yeah, I loved it. I mean, Buddy – Buddy, a defensive-minded coach, you knew about his resume. You knew some of the players that were there, and they offered me when I was there. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm just staying. I'm just going to stay right here. And, boy, I ended up playing with some incredible players. You know, played more of that D-tackle, nose-tackle, over-under type of technique I was a little more used to. <clears throat> and had a ball more, you know, a lot because this was before free agency. Free agency didn't hit till 93, and I got there in 87. So – a lot of us were teammates for years and because there was no free agent movement and we weren't just teammates. We were friends, yeah. you know, for uh, the, the unfortunate part is my God, I think I've lost five guys on that defense, three on the line, Reggie, uh, Jerome Brown, Mike Pitts, then the secondary Andre Waters, Wes Hopkins. It's, that's been tough when the reunions for some of the teams you have are at funerals. That gets, that gets very, very sad because again they were they were friends, not just teammates. But that, that was the best part of my career. Those years there, I had the one year in Miami before my career ended. But the years in Philly, it's just a shame because we had a great defense, some gr I mean great players, and we just we just couldn't get over the hump. You know, we got into the playoffs, but we just couldn't make a move in the playoffs, and certainly uh, couldn't get to where we all wanted to go, and that was the Super Bowl. 
And that's where Buddy Ryan came from. He was a defensive yeah. coordinator for the Bears in 85. But what was it like playing for him? What was he like as a head coach? Well, as a head coach, he was a great defensive coach. I mean, <laughs> um, not a whole lot, unfortunately, went into the offense. Our offense struggled. We had some talent there, obviously. Randall Cunningham, yeah. Keith Byers, Keith Jackson. But <clears throat> just never really clicked on offense. And he was really that defensive guy. Um, and it just, it just didn't work out as well from the, from the overall standpoint of the team. And, you know, it's a shame because I think there was a lot of talent there. We, we really thought 91 was going to be the year, uh, the defense, we had come off a couple of years of being number one. I think we thought the offense was as stacked as it was going to be. And then game one against green Bay, Randall got hit low, blew his knee out. And that was it. We were like, oh my God, that just happened. We thought this was the year and we lose our star quarterback in game one for the season. And uh, that was that. So, um, again, best years from friendship standpoint and my career standpoint of playing my production, playing with guys around me. But just there's always that because we know the talent we had there. And there's just there was just a lot of disappointment that we could never, never get where we wanted to go. You mentioned Reggie White and Jerome Brown, uh, guys, unfortunately, who, who are no longer with us here. But uh, what was it like playing for those guys? I said, you kind of set them up. You know, you cleared the path for those guys to, to maybe get the, the sacks. But uh, I, I would assume playing with guys like that made you even better. It's the joke I use everywhere that they double team me so Reggie and Jerome could be single block, which we all know is complete rubbish. They were, I mean, the two of them, Clyde Simmons was so underrated yeah. as a player. Seth Joyner, probably the hardest working, smartest player I was ever around. Eric Allen, you know, as, as a, I mean, just incredible. But Reggie and Jerome, I watched them run. A, Jerome actually ran it barefoot. Uh, Jerome actually beat Reggie out of the gate. Jerome was unbelievably quick out of the gate. Barefoot. Barefoot, he ran a 4.8. Reggie at 3.15 ran a 4.6. I mean, they were they were just freaks. If Jerome, unfortunately, hadn't passed away, he and his uh, nephew in that car accident, I don't think there's any doubt where his career was heading uh, to the Hall of Fame. Obviously, Reggie is there as, as in my eyes, the greatest D lineman of all time. Um, they were incredible to watch. Um, great teammates, uh, but but they could literally line up wherever they wanted and just beat you. And that that's basically what they did, you know. Jerome lined up on either guard or the center. Reggie could line up on every single lineman going down the line, you know, especially in that 46 defense when he was over the center and us two D tackles would cover the guards and he was one on one with the center. I mean, just watching them play was incredible. Well, it was, was just incredible. But really that whole defense, like I said, from Seth to Byron Evans to Clyde to EA to those the safeties I, I, I was talking about, and unfortunately are no longer with us. It was just – it was a fun defense to watch. We went out there with so much confidence that it didn't matter where anybody got the ball. Not only were we going to stop them, we were going to create a turnover. And through Buddy Ryan, when you create a turnover, you don't just recover it. You try and get points. So, I mean, basically, you did whatever you wanted to do out there. As long as you were productive, he didn't care, man. He didn't care if you're flipping the ball around, scooping stuff, trying – you know, going not where you belong is make sure you can take care of your responsibility. Just get the job done. That's all they cared about. And we had plenty of great players to get the job done. Yeah, I mean, you, rattling off those names, that's an incredible oh, defense shit. that you had. Ridiculous. Like you said, it's and even the offense, again, some of the names you had. And one of them was, as you said, Randall Cunningham, your quarterback. Yep. And he had a show. You had a yeah. segment on that show. Is that kind of where your broadcast career started? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, I was always pretty – pretty open in the locker room. I knew that the media people had a job to do. Um, so I, I had no problem answering their questions. And, and yeah, the, the one TV station said, listen, well, let's do a segment. Uh, would you do one, you know, on the upcoming game? Kind of a humor segment. Like if we went to play Cleveland with their dog pound, I actually went to an actual dog pound, ate Alpo, you know, uh, Kansas City, Arrowhead Stadium. I took archery classes, you know, just kind of dumb little three minute, you know, pieces. They were a lot of fun to do. I enjoyed doing them. Right place, right time. It won like a local Emmy. And that's where, quite honestly, that's where ESPN got involved while I was still playing. Yeah. Um, it would have me do some stuff with them in the off season or during a bye week. So yeah, that was, that was 
pretty much the start of it on a consistent level. Me doing uh, me doing that show. That was uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, your segment like Golik's got it. Golik's uh, got it. Can we, yeah. can we Google that and find? Are those oh, out there somewhere? Yeah, I'm sure they're still out there. I did that. I did a few seasons of a show called The Lighter Side of Sports, which would mm-hmm. set up pranks uh, as well. I enjoy it. I enjoy doing a lot of that. Uh, I really did. Did most of that in the off season. As far as the Golik's got it, I did those on Tuesdays, our day off uh, for the upcoming game. So it was uh, it was a lot of fun to do. And yeah, I, I guess I guess we would say that that kind of started off the broadcasting. So so a great run in Philadelphia, as you said, one year, 1993 with the, the Dolphins. Um, you know, what were you going there? What were you thinking? You know, your, your stop with Miami, were you thinking kind of this is the, the last stop for, for oh. you in your career? Oh, God, no, no, no. You know, I, I retired the most, the way most players retire. The league retires you. Mm-hmm. Nobody called. That means, you know, they say, when did you retire? I said, well, the league retired me in 94 (laughs) because nobody called. So I was a free agent. And so I was training. We We had a house in Orlando and I was training out there while I was a free agent. And I was running hills one day and I, I tore my calf muscle. And the, the bad side was, is I couldn't say anything because I was a free agent. Now I'm damaged free agent. So I had to hide that. Um, not saying it was the, the, the greatest moral move in the world when you're going to sign with the team and you say you're fine and you don't, but you know, there's another side to this as well. So I tore my calf, went and visited a few teams, signed with Miami and I didn't get it operated on because that would have been obviously made public and teams would have known. So I knew as soon as training camp started with Miami, that as soon as I busted into full speed, it was going to, the scar tissue that it built up was going to tear again. It was kind of absolutely knew it was going to happen. And sure enough, it did right in training camp. And I mean, I was busting my ass in the off season to be a free agent. And the toughest part was it tore and I knew it was going to tear. Don Shula came walking by after a tour and said, maybe you didn't work hard enough in the off season. <laughs> and I had to just bite through my lip because I knew I did. Yeah. And I knew I was injured, but I couldn't say that I was injured. So I had to miss basically all of training camp started a few games, but that injury never really kind of went away. It was, it was a shame. So it was a kind of a really kind of a, a bad year. And, and, and from a team standpoint, we were nine and two or seven and two. We were seven and two. We had the best record in the NFL and a, from a fan standpoint, we couldn't sell out the stadium, which was it, it was very different than Philly from fan engagement in Miami. But then also, we um, we were playing in Cleveland, and Dan Marino was in the pocket. Nobody hit him, and he tore his Achilles. Seven and two, best record in football. Dan was done for the year. Scott in step Scott Mitchell. Scott ended up getting a nice deal with Detroit after that year. But we lost the last. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was wrong. I'll go back. We were nine and two. We lost the last five games of the season, last one being in New England in overtime. We didn't even make the playoffs. Mm. So 11 games in, we had the best record in the NFL, and then we did not make the playoffs. And um, I had also hurt my knee while I was dealing with the calf. I hurt my knee in the first game of the season. Uh, So I just played through it through the entire season. And when the season was over, I got it operated on. And when May came around for minicamp, I had a two-year deal. So I was starting the second year of my deal. My knee was okay. It wasn't great. Um, but I was in for minicamp, the mandatory minicamp. And the doctor came in and basically said, you know, how's it? I said, and I, I said, it's fine. This is another one of those where I probably did w- said too much. It wasn't ready to go, but I knew I needed to get back on the field. So I said, it's fine. I want to use minicamp to test it signed that sheet of paper that said I was fine, literally opened the door and standing there was somebody from the front office saying the GM wants to see me. And I was like, oh, shit. I just (laughs) signed my cut warrant when I signed that piece of paper saying I was going to go out on the field saying I was healthy. So I knew it was going to happen. I went up to the GM's office. And as I walked in, I remember I saw on on his desk a list that said players to release. And I saw the other names, obviously my name and the other names. So, you know, told me they were going to cut me and all that, blah, blah, blah. And I, I went back to the locker room and I immediately found all those guys. And I said, dude, you guys are on the cut list. Do whatever you got to do. <laughs> you got to grab a hammy, do something because you're going to get cut. 
you know, you're on that list. And so that's how it, it ended there. In 94, I ran for the, the 49ers about week 12. Um, and they were thinking of signing me, but after I ran for them, that next game, they lost a linebacker. So they signed a linebacker. They ended up winning the Super Bowl that year. <laughs> wouldn't have mattered. I wouldn't have been a big part of it, even if I had signed with them. And then after that, nobody called. So like I said, that was, that was kind of it. Um, I had two kids, much like my dad had two kids and I was on the way. We had two kids, Mike and Jake, and my wife was pregnant with Sydney. And ESPN had, had been talking to me, you know, about post-career. And I thought, all right, you know, I, I wanted to stay in shape in case anybody else called. But again, nobody did. Uh, so I just made the transition uh, into, into the media world. Nine years in the NFL as a defensive tackle is pretty darn good. I mean, do you look back at your time in the NFL fondly? Is is that kind of maybe your most fond years or were your college years or your high school years? Well, I mean, listen, high school is always going to be some of the most fun because you have no responsibility. <laughs> college, it's a little bit more of a business, but I mean, it, it was a fantastic. Pros is a business. Yeah. You know, the NFL all of a sudden, I remember going to the NFL and thinking, man, this is going to be great. How long can they keep us there? I mean, you know, there's only so much practice you can do. I don't have study, you know, classes anymore. This is going to be great. Until I realized I got there at seven in the morning and left at six at night because most of the time in the NFL is spent in a meeting room or in the locker room or in the weight room, not on the field because there's so much to go over. It is, it is your job. Now, listen, I loved it. It was fun. It was football. But it is a job, you know, when, when people are done, you know, in college, you go hang out with your teammates, same in high school, people are going home to their families, like I started to do when my kids were born. I mean, that's your life now. This is what puts food on your table. So while it's a game still, it is also my living. So um, it, it's definitely more of a job, but something I loved doing because that's something tough to do just for the money. Uh, and, and again, the money wasn't great as a 10th rounder. My first year, I made $62,500, um, which is, uh, you know, it's a little different today when the minimum is 500000 Uh, But, you know, I, I love the game. So, I, yeah, I look back on it, you know, the old, you wouldn't change anything. The one thing I would, listen, I'm not going to say that. I, I would change my senior year in college. You know, I would have would have gotten that operation. I would have you know, I, I would have seen what would have happened the next year. If you're sitting there and telling me I had the choice, that would have been the thing to do. Um, people say, well, maybe that would have changed, you know, your your life. Well, I was already dating my now wife of 35 years at that point. So I don't think that would have changed at all. Uh, and to me, that's the most important career path is, is my marriage and then having the kids from that. So I don't think that would have changed. But maybe you know, from a work position, it would have, but not, like I said, I can't complain about nine years in the NFL. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun, made a, a lot of friends, um, through the years. And, and I got to play football from basically eight years old till 32 years old. So gave away parts of my body a little bit, you know, had need a new shoulder at some point, a new knee, but you know, that going in. So you, you kind of understand that that's part of the plan. Yeah, and your wife is still around. 35 years of marriage. You guys just yep. had your anniversary here recently, so congratulations to that. Thanks. I don't care what profession you're in, it's not easy to do. Yeah. Uh, but in that 1995, you said you're forced retirement in 94, 95. You start to make that full transition to broadcasting, right? You move to Arizona. You're on a morning show there, but then also start your relationship with ESPN. Could you ever have imagined what would start then would, would grow to what it became? Oh, no, because, you know, back then – you know, it was basically you were an analyst. If you came out as a football player, you were an analyst in a booth. And that's what I was for college. You know, they, they said, hey, you want to do college games for ESPN and ABC? And I was like, yeah, sure. I'd never done them before. And around that same time, I was fortunate enough, Jacksonville came into being in 1995. And they were looking for a TV analyst for their preseason games. Uh, which was before college in the NFL started. So I, I could do that. And I ended up getting that job as well. And the play-by-play -play was Kevin Harlan, who I've been friends with since that time. And what, what a great way to have somebody help me into the business with a guy like Kevin Harlan. Yeah. So I was in, you know, and I knew it was going to take a lot of work, something that, that I was brought up to do. So I would be in, um, Arizona doing the daily morning show there with a guy named Bruce Jacobs, who I'm still friends with to this day. I, I go on his show occasionally still. 
Then I would fly to my uh, college. I would well, I would fly first to the preseason games to do those. Then I would fly during the the regular season to the college game. So I would do my radio Monday through Thursday. Then I would fly to whatever game I was doing, do it Friday from that place, and then do the game Saturday, come home Sunday, and then Monday started all over again. Well, during that time I was in Arizona, the uh, ESPN also started what's called NFL Live now, was called, started out as NFL Tonight. Uh, Myself, Mark Malone, Sean Salisbury, and Merrill Hodge were the original of that show. It was a a five-night-a-week show that was on during the football season. So now I I would do my show in Arizona. When I had to go to Bristol, Connecticut, I would fly there. I would do the evening show, NFL Tonight. In the morning, I'd get up. they put me in a studio so I could do my show back in Arizona. And then on the weekend, I would fly and do my college game. So it was... It was a lot for sure, but I knew to get my foot in, um, like, like again, from my early, early years up, my dad said, if they ask you to do something, tell them you can do it. So I'm like, yeah, I can do studio. Yeah, I can call games. Yeah, I can do radio. And then I'll figure it out, you know, along the way. And one of those trips back to ESPN to do the studio, the president sat down and said, listen, we're thinking of starting. ESPN Radio had started in 1993, but they there was mainly night shows. Mm-hmm. And they said, we want to start a national morning show. Would you be willing to move to Connecticut and do that? And, you know, as my wife said, you have no choice. You, ha- you have to go do this. This is an opportunity. So we did in 98. We, we left the, the local show in Arizona and flew to... Uh, Bristol to be involved in that morning show along with doing NFL tonight, along with still calling, calling college games, but at least it was in one spot now. And my, my first partner was Tony Bruno in 1998, who I'd known from Philadelphia, my days in Philly, he was, he did local in Philly there, but he was also doing some national stuff for ESPN. So he was my partner in 98 for a year. And then he left. And then we had the the whole uh, auditioning of a bunch of different people before it ended up being Greeny, and he and I started in in 2000. We'll get to that in a moment. I, I want to ask you about uh, Bill Curry, a guy that you work <laughs> oh. with. You guys, I love listening to you guys. I know you respect him quite a bit. What was it like working with him as one of your analysts uh, on those college football games? Bill Curry is, is one of one of the nicest, most respected guys out there, uh, whether in sports are out. You know, my, my dad was always my hero. You know, I didn't have a sports hero. I respected the hell out of my dad. And I said, there were two other men from that side that I respected as much as my dad. One was John Story. He was a coach of mine in high school, football coach and wrestling coach. And the other was, was Bill Curry, uh, who, who I respected like, like my father. Bill, it, it was so great because we would do these games and he and I, we both loved film. So we'd get Uh, Friday to our game and we would go in the film room and basically we would have other people in there with us and they would end up leaving because we just kept going and going and going and going and going and going play after play back and forth, back and forth. Then we'd have lunch or we'd have dinner and we would just talk and just actually I did build it most of the talking. I did most of the listening and just his stories and just his thought process, uh, his morals. I mean, just, an unbelievable human being. I mean, an unbelievable human being that that I, I I was so glad that I got to do the games with, and we're friends to this day. My my daughter just got married in April, and he and his wife Carolyn came out to Arizona for the wedding. It was great to see him. So uh, if that man needed me to do something, I would do it in a heartbeat uh, for him. So he and and he would come on air with us. He had a segment every week and. For those that, that are maybe too young to know, you can Google it, the old E.F. Hutton commercials. Mm-hmm. And part of that was when E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens because they'd get real quiet and listen. And that, that was Bill. When Bill speaks, you listen. And that's how I felt every segment was with Bill. Everybody was listening, millions listening to our show, just stopped speaking for 20 minutes and just listened to Bill <laughs> because of the thing. And he was always got so much great response. That's why... On Greeny and I's last show, Bill was basically our last guest, you know, just to have him on one more time. He was an incredible man. 
That's great. That's great. I can tell the, the respect you have for him. That's awesome. Uh, all right. Let's talk about Mike and Mike here. January 2nd, 2000. What a run you guys had. Yeah. Uh, you said that bringing Mike Greenberg, how did that go? How did that first meeting go? And, 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 you know, how much did you say, have a say maybe in who your, your co-host was going to be? Well, what was interesting is, you know, we had moved the family there at this point we had three and young uh, Mike was 10, Jake was nine, Sydney was five or six. And a year into this, Tony Bruno's leaving. I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm a year into moving my family across country and my partner's leaving. I think he went to I made a few stops, but he went to Fox and certainly, you know, his choice. Um, So I'm like, I have no partner. What's going to happen? So this was in October. So for October, November, they brought in 13 different potential new partners for me. Wow. And Greeny wasn't one of them. So. What, what happened was when a potential partner couldn't wasn't in, they would have someone who worked Sports Center or ESPN News was just starting then. They would have them fill in, right, and just do the show. And it was interesting is my wife listens to every second of every show. And knowing these were auditions, um, show would start at 6. First break would be about 6.15, 6.20. I would call her, and she would say, Oh, this person, they sound pretty good. Or, oh my God, you got a long four hours. <laughs> you know, um, And it went on like this for a, a while. Like I said, over two months to bring in 13 people. And then, like I said, there were the different ESPN people. And then one morning they brought in Greeny, who had been doing ESPN News. I had never met him in my life. I met him probably 10 minutes before the show. <clears throat> and... Greeny's part of the story had always been, listen, I don't know this guy. And listen, I was a lot, lot heavier than I was over 300 pounds. then. you know, not in the greatest shape of my life for sure. <clears throat> Greeny really didn't know me, knew I played, but didn't know me. So Greeny's thought process was, well, I'm just going to throw caution to the wind. He's going to have some fun here. And I was always about that. And he started off and ripped me saying, if we look, stood together, we looked like the number 10, you know, <laughs> and, you know, we just riffed for 15 minutes. and. I remember after that, I called my wife and her quote was, he sounds kind of geeky, but he's the one. And I'm like, he's not even a candidate. You know, he's not even one of the people. She said, well, you know, he should be. And I know they were considering uh, also Linda Cohn, you know, would have been the beauty and the beast, you know, (laughs) kind of a a thought process. Um, But so I don't know if I had to say, I certainly had my input saying that I thought, you know, we... We, we really got together well on the air. We came from such different backgrounds, um, you know, kind of like the odd couple. We used that theme for a while. And uh, but probably so, you know, he got chosen and we started in, in 2000. And I think one of the best things that happened, this was before, you know, so much social media and everything. Right. We yeah. weren't even cleared in Hartford where ESPN is. So our bosses couldn't even hear us. So we literally had a couple of years to kind of work through, you know, how we were going to do the show and chemistry and all that. So that was kind of a plus, which, which unfortunately shows don't have that luxury today. I mean, you're instantly heard, especially a national show, you're instantly heard by a ton of people and they make instant, you know, um, opinions about you. Well, we had a little bit of time and worked through some things and it was weird all of a sudden. You know, Greeny didn't give up. He was on one night a week on SportsCenter. And he's like, I'm not giving that up. He goes, I don't know how long this radio thing's going to last, but I know SportsCenter is going to last. And he's right. SportsCenter is the backbone of ESPN. But somehow, our, you know, we were a national show that started with me and Tony. We started in one market, Chicago, one market in 1998. And then it grew, obviously, to four or 500, something like that. So when Greeny and I took over, we had more than one. We still didn't have a ton. And it was thought national morning shows can never compete in local markets. Well, all of a sudden we were, you know, we were, we were rating higher and higher and and kind of getting the attention of ESPN to the point where I think it was 2004. I think that's the year we went on TV when all of a sudden they said, we're going to put you on TV. And I was immediately bummed thinking, Oh my God, I know when you're on TV on ESPN, you have to wear a coat and tie like I did for NFL tonight. I said, please tell me I don't have to wear a coat and tie at six in the morning, six to 10. They said, no, do your radio show. We'll shoot around it and put it on TV. I was like, thank God. So it started on TV as well and started rating. And all of a sudden 
ESPN was making, you know, ad money on radio and TV, you know, so that made them happy. So eventually that made me and Greeny happy <laughs> when we negotiate. And and it just right place, right time, right mixture, you know, of, of, of two personalities to where it, it really, it really stuck hold and for a long time. And I know we're both very, very proud of that. Yeah. Are you amazed at, at how big it became and, you know, toward the end, all the stories that were swirling around it, it was kind of the drama of this radio show. I'm sure right. brought more people to, to the, listen and to watch the show toward the end of it as well. Yeah. L- listen, we never thought, I mean, we, you start something, you want it to be successful, but you have no idea. We had no idea it would be as successful for as long as it was, you know, running almost 18 years. <clears throat> um, you know, would I have liked it to, to keep going? Sure. Uh, but there's two people involved and, and Greeny felt, wanted to do something else, which is certainly his right. The ending has been obviously played out, you know, uh, uh, a lot over the last few years of how it all went down of not ending that great. But at the end of the day, um, it, it, it's certainly his choice. Uh, if he wanted to, to go to something else, uh, that, that's that's his right to do. Uh, I was bummed it ended. I would have liked to it, it, for it to keep going. <clears throat> but out of it, I'll say, um, you know, Trey Wingo took over after that. And, and also my son, Mike, was on the show. And while that only lasted a few years, I know Trey was very public in saying he did, didn't really like getting up in the morning, which makes it very difficult to do a morning show. Um, but I will say even all the great years – Green and I had and the success we had, nothing will compare to for three years <clears throat> turning on the mics at six in the morning and having your son there. Yeah. You know, I got to work with him for three years and and we've we still work together now, which is great. We'll start working together again. But just for four hours, you know, just that's your son sitting there. You know, any any to work with any any of your kids would just be incredible. So I got to do that. So to me, that was that was the while there was more success in the, the, the uh, me and Greeny's run, you know, from a financial standpoint and notoriety, you know, a couple of Hall of Fames and that, it was a, a great run. Uh, I, don't, I don't think anybody from Tony Bruno to Trey Wingo to Greeny would be shocked that I would be saying that the part I enjoyed the most was the part I got to do with my son. You know, with social media, so many things get out there. Were you finding <clears throat> out from social media that your show's we're over. Or what? How did you kind of find out, Mike and Mike, and then oh, uh, go oh, like no. and Wingo? No, we were. We were. I, I was told by the, the. It was the president that wanted to to, you know, split us up, you know. Um, and as he was saying, make two really good shows, and I, I disagreed. But yeah. you know, again, it's kind of like when I got cut in football. I disagreed with being cut, but doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, I'm not making the decision. So I knew. Uh, the shame of it was, is we found out for Greeny and I about, about a year and a half before it actually happened. Um, so, you know, that, that made it a little more difficult. Yeah. Um, Trey, we knew was, was going to Trey. I knew was going to end because Trey didn't want to do it after the three years. What I didn't know at that point was that that was going to be the end of me doing morning radio at ESPN. I just thought me and Mike would get another partner like a Jason Fitz or, or Stu Gotts or somebody like that but they decided to go in a completely different direction. And all of a sudden, you know, my, my services weren't needed anymore by ESPN, which is again, their right to do. Like I said, I went through it in football. Um, but I, I, I was a little surprised that it went from, you know, no more morning show to being completely out of ESPN. But you know, that there's, I was, this was 2000, what, a couple of years ago. So I'm still, I'm still in my working years. So it's not like I can, you know, I talked about it, you know, this publicly more than a few times, but it's like, you got to move on. You know, everybody's, everybody's moved on to do their thing and I'm going to do the same thing, you know? And uh, so I did, I couldn't worry about it anymore. It's not like when I get cut from Houston and went to Philly, I kept wondering how the Oilers were doing or when I got cut from Philly or are actually signed with um, as a free agent to Miami from Philly. I wasn't sitting there worrying about how Philly was doing. I was worried about my next move. So that's eventually what what I was doing, just worrying about where I was going to do do, do what I was going to do next and where I was going to do it. Yeah, I think in the end, in anybody's profession, you've got to worry about yourself sure, because yeah. you're yeah. the one who's doing yeah. that. Nobody else really is. But 25 years at ESPN overall, I mean, obviously it doesn't end the way you wanted to. But do you look back fondly at that time? And again, what what you became 
as a broadcaster because of your time there? Oh, without question. Just phenomenal memories. Again, it, it and I think this this isn't like new to other businesses. Not everybody gets along with everybody all the time. I've said this about a locker room uh, in football. There's 53 guys. We, we all don't hold hands and sing Kumbaya every day. <laughs> there are guys, you know, that wouldn't want to hang out with me or I wouldn't want to hang out with them. But when you're on the field, you do your job, you know, to for your common goal. So at ESPN, I mean, listen, 98, 99% of the people I got along extremely well with. Um, it was, you know, just a couple people in management that that I disagreed with some of the moves uh, that they were doing. And again, it doesn't matter because they get to make the decisions. But I mean, you know, from the on-air people I work with, you know, from uh, whether it's the, the the NFL shows or the radio with with Tony or with Greeny or with Trey or Mike, and, and like I said, with, with uh, Merrill Hodge and Sean, I still talk to Sean a lot today, and Mark Malone. I mean, and all the people behind the scenes. I mean, I had a great time there, made great relationships, had a wonderful, wonderful experience. But like things, you know, a lot, a lot of things they they come to an end. You know, that last day of cleaning out my my office, which was odd because I cleaned it out. The person who took it over was my son, Mike. He stayed there <laughs> a, few, a couple of more years. That was pretty wild. But uh, and he was actually the last person I saw on campus before I left, because this was also during COVID. Yeah. So nobody was around anyway. We did the last three months of me, Trey and my son in my basement. That was mm -hmm. our studio. Um, but, oh, I mean, just yes, an incredible, incredible experience at ESPN. Absolutely loved it. Well, you reinvented yourself from a football player to a broadcaster. Now you're, you're kind of still doing that a little bit. You're yeah. podcasting and doing some other things. Tell us a little bit about Golik and Smitty and some of the other things and projects that you're working on right now. So the, my first year out of ESPN, I had to decide, okay, what, what, what do I want to do? Do I want to do a, a daily thing? Um, do I want to not? So what I did is I called college games and NFL games uh, for Learfield was a nat the national college game of the week on radio and Westwood one. It was a national, it was, you know, either a Thursday night or a Sunday night or a Monday night game. So I was, I would do a couple of games a week. Um, I would go on different podcasts just to kind of see where I wanted to go. I had a couple of offers to start my own podcast network, which I wasn't at the time kind of ready to do. Um, so I did all that. And then, just, and then I said, okay, after my first year out, I'm kind of decide where I want to go. So DraftKings jumped in, and uh, and so me and Smetty, uh, Jess, Jessica Smetana, uh, she does a lot of stuff with Metal Arc and Dan Levitard and Stu Gotts, and I do a lot of stuff with them as well uh, with Stupidity and God Bless Football. So I've been uh, integrating a little bit more with them because they have such a great relationship with DraftKings. So Smetty and I do that once a week. I have a feeling it's going to lead to more uh, podcasts. Like my son uh, does a show every day for DraftKings. We'll see where that all goes. Um, I would expect it to keep evolving into more usage there because I think DraftKings is doing a great job, not just being a gambling app, but they want to be DraftKings media, you know, radio, podcast, maybe some TV. So so that's why we're doing a, a bunch of sports shows for them. And then I, I decided you know, it was my wife who said it because after, after that first year of kind of doing college and pro games, during the season, we live in our house here at Notre Dame. We have four great seats at Notre Dame Stadium for all the home games. And so that's a, one of the things we talked about. We said, you know what? We we worked hard, you know, for the last 25 years to be in a nice position. And one of that is, part of that is to go enjoy those games. So I, I said I wasn't going to call college games this year, and I'm just going to enjoy going to the Notre Dame games, you know, me and my wife and whoever else is around at that point. I'll, and I'll do a full slate of uh, Westwood won games. At least that's the way it's looking. I'll do a full slate for them. So I'll still be involved in that. I was grateful to them. I got to actually cover my first Super Bowl. I worked the sidelines for them last year, the Super Bowl. It was the first time I actually attended a game. So I'll do that. I'll continue with the podcast. And I'd imagine since that's kind of the way of the world now, I'll probably get more and more uh, involved in the podcast, be it with DraftKings, Stupidity, whatever. Just And, and we do a family podcast. Sorry yeah. in advance that my wife really got going that, that man, every time we do a uh, episode of that, I think, God, we are screwed up. We got a real <laughs> screwed up family, but it's fun to do. We, we enjoy it every couple of weeks, get together uh, and do that. So I, I'm enjoying that. I, will I ever get back to day to day? Maybe. Um, listen, 4.15 in the morning for 23 years was, was tough. 
So would it be in the morning? We'll see. We'll see what opportunities arise. Uh, nothing's out of the question at this point. There have been some nice opportunities, and I do appreciate those. But I'm really happy with what, what I'm doing right now. Uh, and we'll just see if I'm, I'll end up building on it. There is an opportunity as an analyst uh, for the Irish football games on NBC. <laughs> have, have you put that out there at all? Oh, they know I want to do that, yes. Uh, yes, they, they, they do know. Um, there has never been a... Um, uh, former football player in the booth. You know, it's been what Pat Hayden from USC and Mike Mayock from BC and Doug Flutie from BC and Drew Brees from Purdue. So they haven't had uh, a former football player. I'd love to do it. I, but listen, I'd love any former, and we have more than a few former Notre Dame football players who are in this business. I'd be happy for any of them to do it. I, I would like that. I, I think I think Notre Dame, you know, I don't know if they're afraid of homerism, but NBC has the rights to Notre Dame games. I mean, I've called Notre Dame games before for ESPN. Again, when they go on the road, they're not on NBC. So I've called them. I have no problem being unbiased, you know, and, and calling what I see. So I, I don't have a problem doing that. Um, so I wish they would hire a former player. I would love to do it. Like I said, I could save them a lot on travel and hotel since they don't have to fly me anywhere and I have a house. Um, I could, I could save them some money, uh, but I, I would love to do it, but that's, you know, again, not one of those things, uh, that's up to me. Uh, do they know I want to do it? Yeah. Yeah. They, they know I want to do it. And, uh, like I said, if, if, even if it's not going to be me, I would, I, I would hope at some point, another former Notre Dame football player gets to be an analyst for that. Well, I'm a Syracuse alum, so you would work with a great at Syracuse alum and Mike Tarico as well, calling those games, if if that all comes to fruition. Let, 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 let me quickly say, I, I Mike Tarico is is probably the best play-by-play -play guy I've ever worked with. The dude is unflappable. Yeah, I mean, you could sit him in any situation and nothing gets him. He's unbelievable and such a great guy. Two experiences with him, and they were both in Syracuse, is we were out to dinner the night before, uh, and the AD came over and wanted to buy our dinner. And Mike, being the true professional, said, no, no, no. Me, being the true non-professional, said, hell yeah, buy whatever <laughs> you want, man. I'll keep ordering. And then that man, Mike Tirico, at Syracuse, might as well be the Pope because the amount of people that come and genuflect to him and kiss his ring, deservedly so, is unbelievable. That man is so popular, but... Listen, he deserves it. He he is about as good as it gets in this business, without question. Yeah, and there's plenty in this business out there. So yes, there is. That yeah. shows a lot of respect they have for Mike Tirico. Uh, I know we're almost out of time, but uh, your subpar classic. Uh, tell me a little bit more about that. You mentioned it earlier, something that you're going to have coming up soon and that you hope is going to be an annual event. Yeah, you know, because we spend so much time here, again, so many people – from my wife at St. Mary's, her sister at St. Mary's, my two brothers at Notre Dame, Mike, Jake, and Sydney, all doing their sport here at Notre Dame. We love Notre Dame. It's family to us. So well, we, we have a Golic Family Foundation, and we wanted to put the, the tournament on the Warren, on the golf course, uh, on campus. And Notre Dame was actually very happy about that because from what I understand, I guess I didn't know, not many people do that. And we never had a thought of having it anywhere else. We wanted to have it uh, at the Warren. And we're, we're, what we want to do is we want to help uh, area area um, foundations and area uh, businesses. Uh, so we're splitting four ways for this year. It's going to be the Logan Center. It's going to be the Center for the Homeless. It's going to be the um, Humane Society here in South Bend and the Northern Indiana uh, Food Bank. So those four will split uh, the money we make four ways. Uh, all in the area here because South Bend is really, really growing incredibly well right now on the outskirts of Notre Dame. So I was very happy with a lot of the response. We'll have players coming in from the 70s all the way to just now. Uh, so a lot of a lot of different types of, uh, of players coming in. A lot of teammates I haven't, haven't seen in a while. Some teammates I played with in the NFL. So Looking to have a ball. Uh, it's right. It, the Billy. It's the 26th and 27th. The night of the 25th is a Billy Joel concert. Some people are going to stay after that. We have a big party the the night of the 26th on the green, right out right on campus. Have entertainment, silent auction items, live auction items, and then golf on Monday. And very appreciative of the response we got from the former players who who are going to come in to uh, for this. 
and help us raise what we hope is going to be a lot of money. And we hope this is year one of many years of, of helping out uh, area places that need some help. We saw your, your pug. Was it Hank? Hank. I love Hank is, we, I was a pug owner as well until we had to uh, put our dog down last uh, February. There's something special about pugs. What makes him special? Hank is the OG, man. Hank is 11. Um, I always got that tongue out. Hank, one of his first TV appearances was uh, we did our Mike and Mike. We did a show at Notre Dame when college game day was here. And, and so when we were doing our show, it was on TV. Then Hank got on TV. I don't even think it was a year old. Uh, so he has been on TV for a long time. And that was when our, our the studio was in my basement. And basically, Hank and Harry, Harry's our six-year-old pug, they would just walk in and out of the set, just do their thing, you know. And, and you know, the great thing was we weren't in, at ESPN, so they couldn't say anything. They were they were never – and they never did. They were never like, oh, you can't have dogs. And they were all cool about it. But, yeah, Hank just came in and hang out, man. He just took over. He is He is the man. I love pugs. We'll leave you on this. How can people follow you? Again, we showed the website for the, the golf classic, but how could they follow you? How could they get involved with some of the things that you're doing? And and again, follow your, your podcasting career and whatever's coming next for you. Yeah, I, pretty easy. I, I somehow got for Twitter at Golick. So <laughs> that, I, I can't even screw that up. And then on Instagram, it's at Golick Senior, G-O-L-I-C-S-R. And usually anything that's going on, I will, I will put that uh, there. Um, the, as far as the website, Golic subpar classic.com is a website to go to, to check out. We're going to put a lot of, um, silent auction items online. So even if people aren't here, they can bid on them. we got a lot of really, really good stuff. So give people who aren't here a chance to get some as well. Uh, so that's a way they could check out for the tournament. Other than that, either on Instagram or, or, uh, uh, Twitter. I usually post everything that's going on that, that we're doing. So those are those are the easiest ways. Well, I know the other day you posted that things should be fun, shows should be fun. This certainly was fun, Mike, catching up with you and and uh, hearing your story and, and seeing what's uh, you know again on the horizon for you with your career. And I can't thank you enough for spending a little time with us here today. Oh, my pleasure. Enjoyed it very much. Thanks. Well, great stuff there from Mike Golick Sr. again, maybe coming to NBC at some point as analyst on those Notre Dame football broadcasts. We'll wait and see that. Until then, be sure to check him out on his podcast and what he's doing now post-ESPN. Our thanks to Glenn McNow helping us connect us with Mike Golick Sr. and for Mike's time here today. And for you, as always, for watching us, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Coming up next week, it's another sports and cinema episode. Vince Papali from the movie Invincible. Yes, the man who played for the Eagles as well will join us. You don't want to miss that episode. That'll be next week on another edition of In the Front Row with Mike Vaccaro. Have a great day, everybody.